Well, it looks like people are just slowly trickling in, so I guess we can go ahead and get started. Uh, really excited to be talking with everybody uh, this morning, this afternoon, tonight with our good buddy Ricardo Rocha, uh, talking about just managing multiple uh, cluster, multiple Argo clusters, and how do you get uh, multiple deployments at scale? Or get up to Argo CD. A little bit about Ricardo, don't want to speak, steal all of us thunder, but Ricardo worked for a really amazing place, CERN. So if you're unfamiliar with CERN, they do a lot of good for humanity. Uh, if you've ever been to www.anything, the World Wide Web is invented at CERN. And also with CERN, uh, they do a lot of uh, particle physics um, and just really advancing science for everybody. Uh, I'm just reading a Wikipedia article. You know, they they were one of the first places uh, outside the government agencies that had petabytes of data, right? So you can imagine this, the scale of the science that is leveraged at CERN and just looking to modernize how those workloads are deployed, how those workloads are, workloads are managed, uh, takes a modern stack. And, uh, you know, Ricardo was at the forefront of that. But Ricardo, uh, don't want to steal too much here, Thunderman. Uh, maybe give a little bit of a background about yourself and a little bit, just uh, go ahead and kick off the talk. Awesome. Yeah, thank you very much, Harry. And uh, I'm super happy to, to present today at the Argo Meetup. Uh, thanks a lot for the invitation. Uh, so I'll, I'll talk a bit more about myself, but today the I'll, I'll be covering a bit some work we've done uh, regarding uh, deploying um, some of our workloads using Kubernetes, but specifically using multi, multiple clusters of Kubernetes. And then on the second part, I'll also talk about uh, deploying multiple clouds uh, and how GitOps and uh, specifically Argo CD uh, has helped us uh, in this in this journey. I'll try to also give a bit of a background of why we are constantly looking at uh, this kind of resources and uh, trying to push a bit uh, the envelope um, to fulfill our needs. Uh, so again, I'm, uh, as Rory said, I'm a computing engineer at CERN. Um, I work in the um, uh, cloud team, uh, which is, uh, we, we, we have a large data center on premises and we have a cloud team that manages it, but it's also the team that kind of uh, manages the bursting to the, to the public uh, cloud and external resources. Uh, my main focus is on uh, Kubernetes and containers. Um, I also do quite a bit of networking and software defined networks. And uh, the last year or two, I've also focused quite a bit in uh, accelerators and GPUs, mostly for uh, fulfilling uh, some needs we have internally for machine learning workloads and uh, trying to help on the infrastructure side on that. At the same time, um, I also do uh, a bit of work upstream in the CNCF. So I represent CERN in the CNCF and the user community. Uh, we joined the CNCF a couple of years ago. Uh, I'm a member of the CNCF Technical Oversight Committee, uh, TOC, uh, together with some great people. And I also le co lead the CNCF Research User Group, uh, which is a kind of a group that focuses more on the specific use cases and workloads that uh, research uh, groups need, uh, need. And this can be like research organizations or academic organizations, but also other types of organizations that have uh, research like workloads like finance, for example. And this means things like HPC, batch, and I'm, I'm very keen on, on making sure these workloads are, are treated as uh, um, like primary workloads in the, in the Kubernetes and cloud native ecosystem. Uh, so we've been doing quite a bit of work. I'm actually also, uh, we were discussing before the starting the meetup uh, about KubeCon Valencia. So I'm, I'm co-chairing uh, uh, the KubeCon uh, now in May in Valencia, and again in Detroit in October, uh, together with Emily and Jasmine you know, for Valencia. So I'll be pretty awesome. I hope uh, I will see many of you there. And uh, talking to Ravi, I'm happy to take any questions at any time. So if you have any any questions, stop me, and uh, I'll be happy to answer. So a bit about CERN, uh, just as a bit of a background. So CERN is uh, the European Organization for Particle Physics. Uh, it was founded in 1954, and it has as main goal really to do fundamental science and to answer some pretty cool questions like what is 96% of the universe made, made of? What's dark energy and dark matter? Uh, what was the state of the matter, matter just after the Big Bang? We have some dedicated experiments that look at uh, like uh, what's called quark gluon plasma, which is a state of matter right after the Big Bang when the energy and the, the, the matter was very hot. Uh, 
and the energy is very high. And then why isn't there antimatter in the universe? Uh, uh, we don't see it. We know that theoretically the same amount should have been created of both matter and antimatter, but we only see, see matter. So we try to understand why this is the case. And for that, we actually built what we call the antimatter factory. It's just down the road from my office and uh, we actually make antimatter and try to understand better uh, the characteristics of, of this um, uh, yeah, antimatter. For doing all this and trying to answer these questions, what we do is we build uh, large scientific instruments. So the biggest one that you've probably heard of is the Large Hadron Collider, uh, the LHC. It's a 27 kilometer uh, um, particle accelerator that is uh, 100 meters in the ground. And uh, in this accelerator, uh, you can see a bit for the size, you can see like the, the Alps, the European Alps on the back and the Mont Blanc here on the top. Uh, which is uh, uh, the highest peak in the, in the, in Europe. And then you can see the Geneva airport a bit for the scale behind the accelerator. Uh, in this in this accelerator, we inject two beams of protons and we make them uh, uh, circulate in the accelerator in opposite directions. We accelerate them to very close to the speed of light, very high energies, and then we make them collide at specific points, these two beams, where we've built this very large experiments like the CMS, uh, LHCB, Atlas, and ALICE. And this is these detectors are like gig gigantic machines that act as a kind of cameras, uh, not quite traditional cameras, but uh, it's kind of a similar thing. Uh, and we try to see what happens in these collisions and then uh, try to understand a bit better the, the, the matter. Uh, a bit more in detail and the very tiny, uh, which is the whole purpose of, of, uh, of this type of experiments. Um, so to have a bit of a look, so this is the tunnel 100 meters in the ground. You have a bunch of magnets uh, across uh, 27 kilometers. Uh, we accelerate the, the beams inside. Uh, one of the uh, main characteristics is that because it's high energy, we actually have to cool it down to very low uh, temperatures, actually 1.4 Kelvin, which is very close to the absolute zero. And that's why very often people say that this is the coolest place in the universe and uh, it's, uh, it's not far from it. Um, and then we make these beams collide at specific points. As I said, we build this uh, uh, big caverns uh, underground. This is the compact muon solenoid. The, the name of this detector is CMS. Uh, it's called compact, but it's actually 14 tons. And you can see the people there for kind of scale. It's a pretty massive uh, detector. Uh, and th this is basically what I was mentioning before. It's kind of acting like a camera taking 40 million pictures uh, a second. And uh, then we have to record all this data. Uh, in reality, each of these experiments generates something like one petabyte of data per second, which is obviously not something we can store um, with the current technology and analyze particularly. So what we do is uh, we have different triggers, which are basically filters that uh, reduce this amount of data, uh, removing a lot of the noise uh, from one petabyte a second to something like uh, uh, 10 gigabytes a second per experiment. And this is something we can uh, record and analyze with the computing power we have. So in, in, in reality, we, we Beam operating, we, we generate something like 70 petabytes of data per year. Uh, in total, we are already uh, getting close to one exabyte with the multiple years that we've been running these this experiments. So it's a lot of data, which means we have to do a lot of uh, uh, research into trying to improve constantly our infrastructure, making the best out of what we can have without increasing the amount of resources we have available because this, this uh, does not change. So what, what we keep doing is trying to look at new technologies and this could be like infrastructure rela related like Kubernetes, but it could be also more specific like uh, accelerators or GPUs. Uh, there's a big trend of moving from CPUs to GPUs for, for improved efficiency, uh, but it can be a lot of things, it could be also software optimizations in some areas. And because this is a large, uh, organization and large collaborations. We also kind of have spin-off uh, technologies coming up from time to time. Uh, Ravi was mentioned the World Wide Web. So this was created uh, 
back in 89 and donated in 91 because there was a need to exchange information between physicists. And they came up, or Tim Berners-Lee came up with this uh, cool technology that then was given to the public and, uh, and uh, kind of exploded pretty quickly. This is a background of CERN. Uh, I invite you all, if you pass by uh, Geneva in Switzerland, to, to come and visit it. So we have a visit service and we, we are happy to, to give you a tour. So just to give you an, uh, an idea, so we, we actually have a large data center uh, to process all, all of this that is something like uh, 300,000 cores. Uh, and we explore a lot uh, resources a bit across the world that uh, from institutions that collaborate with us that uh, can, we, can we, we can have something like uh, all, close to a million cores uh, to process all, all this data. For the Kubernetes setup, uh, the use cases keep piling up, but uh, what we offer is kind of a Kubernetes as a service, very close to what the public cloud providers also offer. And uh, this means that uh, the numbers exploded. We have like 600 clusters. Uh, uh, when I took this screenshot at least, uh, more than 3000 nodes, uh, like uh, 13,000 cores. And th this this is not the core of the physics workloads. This might, by, they gradually, uh, move to Kubernetes, but this is not the core of the physics workloads. This is a ton of other workloads that uh, our users ask for and uh, that we run on Kubernetes today already. So I'll, I'll split the talk in two parts. And uh, in both of them, I'll try to highlight the importance of GitOps and also the, the space of Argo in, in this setup. Uh, so basically, we have a lot of resources on premises. So we try to uh, make it easy to deploy uh, the workloads on Kubernetes on-premises. And then I'll talk on the second part on uh, public clouds or external resources and what are the use cases for those and uh, what are the challenges there as well. So one, one of the things we've been uh, pushing for, for a couple of years already is that uh, instead of going for very large clusters or single clusters, uh, with multiple workloads, we've always pushed to, for people to have multiple clusters. And there, there are multiple reasons to, for doing this. Uh, the work isolation, workload isolation is much easier if you do that. And this was particularly true, like if you would use Kubernetes like four years ago, it's not so much true now. It's multi-tenancy is much uh, better supported now. But still, uh, if you really want to, to, to have more flexibility and like give more freedom to your to your users uh, it's still an option but then there's things like reducing the blast radius uh, things like cluster upgrades can really break your control control plane and, and give downtime or like an error uh, on some operation can can give downtime to to, to your users so doing this in a multi-cluster way kind of gives you a, a way to rolling upgrade or 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 do things in in steps so that you kind of reduce uh, the the impact if things go wrong and they they do go wrong quite often, so it's it's quite nice to to do this. Uh, we I have an anecdote from just two two weeks ago where we had uh, a script uh, that we usually use for maintenance of different things that actually started deleting a bunch of clusters in our infrastructure, and the impact could have been dramatic. But in reality, uh, most of the workloads had even no downtime, just some degradation because they follow this, this idea of multi-cluster. So this is something, uh, if we get uh, brave enough, one, one day we'll talk about this incident. It's, uh, it's pretty, pretty intense. Uh, well, uh, maybe we, we, we give a presentation with more details about it. Uh, then things like upgrades, they're always tricky to do in place. Um, we don't have the resources to really test all the use cases we, we have to support and the different configurations we allow in the clusters uh, to test them very thoroughly. So we are more confident with people just deploying new clusters with a new version and, uh, and just gradually move the workloads to the new clusters and delete the old ones. And then things like heterogeneous resources, we also support uh, like heterogeneous clusters, but in some cases it's easier just to have multiple multiple clusters. Now, the big problem is that the, the management of applications across multiple clusters can be quite tough uh, if you don't have proper automation. So you might have uh, good automation to deploy once, but then uh, if you have 
to constantly repeat this and to deploy to multiple endpoints at the same time with slightly different configurations even, then this is where things like GitOps become incredibly useful. And uh, like when we when we demo these things internally for people that are not familiar with this uh, kind of deployment, it, they usually say it's like black magic and it kind of is a bit, but, uh, but it's really easy uh, our, our work. Now, we, we've been having pretty large infrastructure for quite a while. So we've been doing virtualization for over a decade and uh, we have configuration management systems, things like Puppet, uh, Ansible, things like this. Majority is Puppet. Uh, so actually for the Puppet deployments, we, we already have mostly uh, uh, the whole infrastructure driven by, by Git. Uh, so people are used to that. And this is also something that actually eases the transition of people that are used to virtual machines and to logging into the machines and things like this to uh, start being productive for the Kubernetes clusters as well, because they don't have to understand all the data details of how to interact with Kubernetes. They have to, to understand the interface, which in this, in this case is pretty much YAML for most of it. It's just doing changes in YAML in Git. And then they can build confidence of actually then interacting directly with the clusters if needed. So it's a, it's something that works quite well. People feel immediately productive because they they can kind of read the YAML and understand where they can tune things as needed. Um, so then there's a lot of motivation to 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 move from from things like virtual machines and and puppet like uh, systems, which is to to like explore the containerization, things like uh, immutable com components, uh, uh, the reconciliation, which is one of the key features of Kubernetes, uh, and the feedback it gives you on the on the state of the resources, and then this idea of declarative state, which allow you to like express how things should look in a in a global way instead of uh, having to declare for each machine or type of machines how things should look which makes it very hard to to do like global decisions across your farm so i'll i'll do a couple of uh, two examples here of why this thing of multi cluster is is important for us uh, this idea of vms as cattle uh, pets versus cattle that existed in VMs, we tried to push this into clusters as well. And in this example, I, I'm trying to show how we would do this for, for a cluster uh, version upgrade. So imagine you have two clusters uh, with 50% of your traffic going you know, on each, then you could just add a new one with a, a smaller fraction and running a newer version of Kubernetes, uh, you, you direct a smaller fraction of the of the traffic there and you validate a bit. And I, I put here 121 to 122 because it's a very interesting upgrade if you tried it uh, with a um, huge number of things that uh, were deprecated and stopped being available. So it's actually quite a big upgrade for, for the applications and a lot of testing is required. So this, this kind of roll, rolling uh, upgrade is very very nice for the situations uh, like we also support uh service type load balancer in this case we actually support registering nodes from different clusters into the same load balancer backend it's something that it's kind of our own solution right now but we would like to to kind of expand this uh, and use things like uh, some cluster mesh or even service mesh so it's things we are looking at, but we are not using today. So then eventually you would drop one of the old clusters and split half half. And at the last step, you would deploy a second cluster with the new version and back to the initial situation with the upgraded clusters. This is something that we promote a lot. We do a lot of training and dissemination internally. And uh, like, as I was mentioning this incident we had two weeks ago, that could be like catastrophic like because people actually follow uh, and build on these ideas uh, kind of saved saved us a bit all right so then uh, regarding deployments there are some details here that are important uh, we try to keep this release channels uh, it's still not uh, we are still not completely uh, happy with what we 
the way we do things. But the idea is that uh, if you would deploy uh, a cluster with 121 or 122, uh, we have a bunch of add-ons that we add internally, things like uh, access to the internal storage systems we have or the identity systems we have. And these are uh, often dependent on the version of Kubernetes uh, in, in many different ways. So we kind of link, uh, the, the add-ons are basically all defined as Helm charts. And we have this idea of a meta chart or an umbrella Helm chart. It's a top level one that then has, has dependencies, all the add-ons that should be installed. And uh, we kind of use Git, uh, when you deploy a cluster, we, we use branches for, for each version so that we can uh, like upgrade uh, the add-ons and keep them up to date for each specific version of Kubernetes. Uh, that's one way of looking at it. And the other way that people can also choose to, to deploy is to have this idea of uh, um, stable and uh, QA uh, channels, which are uh, kind of more rolling upgrades. You're not tied to the version, but, but uh, you are able to like test new features that will show up uh, um, very soon. And you can kind of validate it with your workloads early if you want. Uh, it's an optional, op optional uh, um, possibility. So as I mentioned, then the configuration of the cluster, there's a component that does all the orchestration and then the add-ons, the the additional configuration is basically, basically just the YAML for, for a Helm meta chart with all the dependencies and all the configuration for the whole cluster. And uh, this can be tuned at deployment time by, by the users. And it's quite flexible. We, we give quite a lot of flexibility here. So just then as, as an example of how these things look, and we start looking at YAML already. So you can see like uh, in the chart, we have a bunch of dependencies. This is uh, things like base is just base components that have to be there. EOS is one of our internal uh, storage systems, actually the, the major one, um, like setting up for GPUs, FluentD, so that uh, logs are pushed centrally, our uh, network database, uh, Prometheus specific things, uh, two more uh, storage systems, FFS, things like this. And then uh, how each of these uh, add-ons has its own configuration bits. And uh, this is where people can actually enable, disable, or even change slightly some of the parameters if they want. All right, so th then I mentioned before, uh, training and dissemination being essential for, for onboarding people in our, in our cloud, in our Kubernetes service, basically. Uh, we do, uh, we have a bunch of tutorials. We do a lot of uh, uh, webinars and things like this. And uh, it's really things, if you start doing multi-cluster, there's a lot of questions that you will have to ask yourself about uh, how do I do like load balancing across multiple clusters? Or if I'm using a stateful workload, how do I do this across multiple clusters as well? Um, and then there's more uh, specific things like how do I manage secrets that have to go to multiple clusters? And one very specific one is, for example, if you have an endpoint, that has an SSL uh, certificate from Let's Encrypt, for example, how do you actually propagate that certificate across multiple clusters? Because usually things like Cert Manager will be single cluster. So all of this we try to document and we do, like we, we started looking at uh, uh, GitOps with Flux and some people, a lot of people use Flux for their deployments, V1 and V2. And then there's a lot of people that started looking at Argo and uh, there are some, some big benefits of using Bar Argo when you're using multiple clusters. So that's why uh, there was a, a big push for that. So we, we wrote this GitOps getting started and, uh, and uh, there are multiple variations of that these days. So that's, that's kind of the on-premises world. I'll, I won't go into a, a lot more detail, but uh, I think the, the cool part is that once you start doing multi-cluster, you're pretty much ready to do uh, uh, multi-cloud because uh, we do have some internal services to do things like orchestration of the Kubernetes deployments. But when you're using the public cloud, then you actually have the opportunity to use manage, managed Kubernetes services and where your life becomes much easier. You just really have to, to act on the specific add-ons that you care about um, to integrate with your the rest of your resources. So 
there are a lot of motivation to use public cloud at CERN. I mentioned we have uh, big requirements in terms of compute. Uh, there's uh, some, some use cases are kind of 24 seven, things like uh, what we call simulation, which is very important. We need a lot of simulation data to validate all our algorithms and then compare with the real data. Um, so there's a lot of uh, compute power required for that. Uh, also reconstruction. So I mentioned uh, the, the detectors act as cameras, but actually the data that we collect has then to be reconstructed into what events were actually happening between the uh, during the collisions. Uh, so those are 24 seven, uh, but we have a ton of other workloads that are very spiky, uh, things like data analysis. Uh, there will be regular analysis happening constantly, but we will have like international physics conferences happening during summer and suddenly you have like a huge spike of demand on analysis for like a month before the conferences. Uh, then things like uh, GPUs that start being really important for us, not only for machine learning, but even for traditional scientific computing. Uh, we have some GPUs on premises, but we don't have a lot. So uh, being able to uh, be flexible in integrating external resources into our infrastructure, it's very important to, to be able to offer this kind of resources to our users. Um, also because this, this specific uh, GPU and also TPU uh, workloads are even more spiky. Uh, if we just uh, over provision on, on, on premises, this can be uh, very costly uh, because they are expensive. They take a lot of power. And uh, so you, you, you really try to maximize their usage. And then things like uh, when we, even if we want to buy on-premises, we want to evaluate different workloads with different types of resources like GPUs or ARM CPUs and validate which one gives us the best value for money. Uh, access to the cloud, actually, uh, I have a couple of examples where we, we run like three or four workloads across uh, all the possible GPUs in all the three major uh, public cloud providers. And then we can validate which one gives the best value for money, which for us is like how many events you can process per second, for example. And then we can say, if you need 1 billion events uh, processed, how much does this cost with each kind of resource? And, and we kind of developed an infrastructure internally to, to, to easily uh, do this across all these resources. Uh, and then finally, uh, disaster recovery, which is kind of more traditional workload for, for IT to use uh, external clouds or public clouds. So I mentioned this here back in 2019, we started looking at public clouds a bit more seriously to for large workloads. And we did at KubeCon in Barcelona, we did a, a demo where we tried to rediscover the Higgs live on stage. Um, the initial analysis uh, took uh, like more than a day. And we had a slot of uh, like 20 minutes. So given like introductions and the things, we had to do the analysis like in five minutes. So we, we, we tried to containerize the workload. The, the discovery was done in 2012, but the software was actually from the early 2000s. It was pretty old, but we were able to containerize it and uh, put it in a uh, uh deploy it in a kubernetes cluster do some validation internally with the resources we had available on premises for this kind of demo of course we couldn't go to the scale we we needed for for doing it in five minutes so we partnered partnered with the google cloud and we actually managed to do this to process a 70 terabyte data set in in less than five minutes using twenty five thousand cores in the cloud and this really showed we could create a cluster, scale to 25,000 cores, finish the analysis, scale down, pay only for the usage. And uh, this kind of validates the, the principle of what we were looking looking for. So in, on stage, we're actually building, this is the Higgs plot that you see here from CMS. So this is uh, all this excitement about particle accelerators and big machines and all this fancy stuff. But what physicists actually want is to see a plot like this, that this is what gets them most excited, which is uh, seeing something that shows the expectation according to what's called the standard model of physics, and then some real data that where you see like an inconsistency between the two, which means new physics. And this is at the time was the, the Higgs boson. So that was pretty cool, but it actually 
was a stunt because we we had a very uh, static infrastructure and it had uh, uh, like it took a while to make it work uh, and it 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 wasn't flexible it 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 really wouldn't work for generic uh, use cases we have and also it didn't work for things like we wanted to support multiple cloud providers uh, because we don't want vendor lock in and we want to support multiple regions and I'll mention a bit more why this is important as well. Uh, then we don't want people to have to transition from whatever tools they are using to new tools. So we want to integrate with our internal services. We have a batch system, an HPC system in-house. Uh, we want people to st still submit to those and then the, the, the workloads will actually run somewhere else. And the same is for like GitLab runners or, or, or uh, CI, CI, CD is also a very nice way to integrate external resources. Uh, then we want to centralize monitoring. We want to uh, integrate all these resources into our usual thing, uh, our usual way of, of tracking all of this. And then costing is huge, uh, hugely important. So th there's a lot of work to, to, to improve that. Uh, at, at back in the days, it was really a stunt. So also uh, while doing this, we, we understood that uh, the public cloud, like it kind of feels like it's an inf infinite uh, availability of resources. And it's kind of true for CPUs. Like it still impresses me that you can, you can just launch, I don't know, 30,000 core cluster and no one seems to even send you an email about this. They don't seem to notice, uh, it's pretty impressive. But then if you start looking at GPUs and specifically if you're using things like spot, uh, they used to call, be called preemptables in GCP, but they are called spot again. Uh, if you start talking about several hundreds or thousands of GPUs, then you really have to be flexible on the, the regions you, you support because you might not have all the types of GPUs in all the regions or the capacity that you need. So it's very important to, to have this flexibility. Uh, and then, yeah, spot is is hugely uh, cost effective, specifically for our workloads, which uh, are uh, very independent from each other. We can really explore spot spot instances quite well. Uh, so it's it's something we we really put a lot of effort to stay flexible on the clouds, the regions, and that we can choose. Which brings us, yeah, I'll, I'll just show here an example. So this is a machine learning example. Uh, where we went from someone that came with some code to us uh, that could run on one GPU, we containerized it, uh, eventually deployed it in a Kubernetes cluster and went to the cloud. And uh, we basically scaled from one GPU to 128 GPUs. And this is a very nicely uh, behaving uh, workload that scales almost linearly. So for each epoch, we could get a, a hundred times speed up. Uh, and because it's linear, uh, speed up almost it's very cost effective so th this kind of shows uh, uh, why all of this is very important for us uh, being flexible multi-cluster multi-clouds and being able to manage all this chaos in a kind of uh, uh, simple way so now i'll focus more on the actual infrastructure for the rest of the talk and uh, i'll talk about uh, how we try to do this so basically we want to focus on uh, having a central, centrally managed deployment across all of these different resources, on-premises and every cloud we can reach, every region we can reach. And this includes uh, the clusters, the add-ons to the clusters, the space components that should be there, things like monitoring and identity registries, things like this, and then the applications themselves. Then I mentioned we should be able to support multiple clouds, multiple regions, uh, the base services, and then we should also uh, be able to support different uh, ways to deploy the applications. So we don't want people to have to write a Helm chart, or we don't want to have to just customize, might be they just want to use YAML. So we should be able to support all of these things. And like from, from here, it's it starts being obvious why things like Argo CD are, are really important because they kind of give us an abstraction of uh, what could uh, otherwise be quite complex. So our deployments, in our deployment of this type of infrastructure, we consider three uh, layers. Uh, the first one I call the underlay, which are the clusters themselves. This is something that was kind of a breakthrough in our uh, uh, 
way of doing things, which is we realized the clusters themselves could be managed by Kubernetes. Uh, before we had to use things like Terraform or even manual deployment to individually deploy the clusters and then maybe register them individually into Argo. Uh, but adding a cluster uh, impl implied a lot of manual work and there was no uh, integration with the rest of the infrastructure. Then suddenly we, we found, and I will talk about uh, things like cross-plane, where basically you can already treat the cluster as an, just another resource on, on your Kubernetes deployments and uh, supporting like a ton of different uh, uh, ways of deploying these clusters. Uh, over that, you have this infrastructure, which is basically the add-ons, the, infra the infrastructure services that should be everywhere. And this is important for us. And I will mention a bit in a diagram after. Uh, we need to integrate uh, the external resources with a lot of our internal systems, like storage systems or software distribution or monitoring or log, log collection, things like this. And then on top of that, we have the end user, the actual workloads that run on the different clusters and we do the mapping between one and, ones and the others. So the way we do this is really, there's a single Git repository where we put all of this, the clusters, the infrastructure add-ons, what should be where, and then the actual applications from the users also mapped to the clusters where they should be running. And all this complexity, like obviously it's not uh, the, the simpler uh, Git repository, but it, it's actually pretty reasonable. Uh, you, can, you can navigate it pretty pre, pre easily. So in Argo, in the Argo way of visualizing things, this is uh, what you see. So you have this underlay, you have the infrastructure services, uh, the infrastructure add-ons, and then you have services and workloads on top of that. One, one really key feature here is the feedback that you get from Argo, this idea of reconciling constantly with the state of the different clusters, the different pieces of your infrastructure. The fact that you don't have to do anything like cron job to constantly check this or rerun the, the, the state to see if the state is matching what you want. Like this, this automatic reconciliation and feedback is really, really amazing. And then this is pretty much how it looks. Uh, you can see we have this cluster at CERN that, that then we have a bunch of clusters in different clouds, different regions. And the reason for that I mentioned, like you can have one cluster say in Europe West 4, in GCP where you have uh, some types of GPUs and maybe access to TPUs for machine learning things. And then in another one, you might have another type of GPU because it's not available elsewhere or because spot is, uh, uh, it has more capacity in this, in this specific region. And then for example, you go to, for AWS because you need ARM and then you can go for sure for things like IPU, but we actually do a bit of everything everywhere. And then um, each of these clusters is actually just a, a small bit of YAML in our, in our main Git repo. So here you can see that uh, the definition of cluster has like the, the name of it and then the cloud, uh, the region where it should be running, the, the cluster version, and then some details of how each node group or each node pool should be, should be looking, uh, type of nodes, things like this. And uh, we configure auto scaling in pretty much all of them uh, so that uh, basically we only pay when, when the resources are actually requested. Uh, so here you see this YAML. The, the, the key here is really that all this YAML gets translated to, to uh, cross-plane uh, custom resources. So in this case, uh, you can see that this would be translated to a GKE cluster uh, uh, that has a template for, for the cluster itself and then for the, for the node pool in, in cross-plane. Uh, this cross-plane is something we started using maybe a year ago. The project is really moving super fast. Uh, there, it's something we are really happy with. Uh, we only use it for external clouds because internally we have a, an OpenStack cloud and, and there's no cross-point provider for OpenStack uh, yet. Uh, but we plan to, to also integrate that uh, into the on-premises deployments as well. Um, the integration with Crossplane and Argo is something that uh, is 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 something that 
could can be improved and it's something we're looking forward to as well we actually just had a presentation from crossplane at an earlier meeting today for the cncf research user group and uh, the, it was mentioned that there's a, a specific ticket to, to work on this so that's pretty good so like if you would navigate our argo cd uh, deployment you would see uh, some outrageous things like uh, a lot of clusters with a lot of node pools this is just an example uh, the actual one could be a bit more dramatic than this but but again you this feedback that you see uh, when you have issues with the cluster when like the cluster is being upgraded or something is broken this is very important for us because then we can integrate with all, all the other systems behind it but uh cross plane became really a like a uh, an important piece of, of all this deployment. Uh, I I'm giving an example for clusters, and this is uh, for this underlay idea, but actually uh, another thing that we do is, for example, if you need S3 buckets, uh, we, we also can, can manage them using Crossplane, which is pretty cool. All the cloud resources can be managed like this. And then, yeah, the base services is the next layer, which is uh, things like the registry. So we do, uh, we use uh, Harbor and uh, we do things like replication rules or pull through caches to, to propagate the, the software and the images to, to the remote uh, resources. Things like the open policy agent, Prometheus and Thanos and uh, um, CVMFS, which is an internal file system we have to distribute software as well. So all these components are automatically deployed everywhere and uh, then registry uh, connected to the, to the internal ones, which means we can have things like a nice dashboard where we can choose the cloud and the cluster and suddenly we see all the GPUs that's across all our, our infrastructure around the world. That's pretty cool. Uh, here's an example of uh, how we integrate with GitLab. So if you use GitLab at CERN, you can just specify like the type of GPU you want. And this is, uh, can be, Pretty much any NVIDIA GPU enterprise card that you can think of. We don't have them, but we just use them wherever they're available in the public cloud. You can also integrate with TPUs. This is something that is really cool. Using TPUs is not easy, uh, but suddenly with this infrastructure, we can have, offer a, like in your CI CD, you can just train your model using uh, TPU. Uh, so I think that's that's pretty much the workloads. What I will mention about workloads, if you have questions, I'm happy to, to give a bit more detail of what we are running there. And before finishing and taking questions, there are some internal questions that we have, things that we would like to, to work on. And the first one I mentioned that uh, we, we actually manage the Kubernetes clusters themselves with Argo. Uh, this brings a, a funny thing, which is you need to register those clusters with Argo itself to then deploy the additional components like the add-ons, the workloads. It's kind of brute bootstrap issue uh, that maybe there, there's like if people think about it, uh, if we'll think about it a bit better, uh, like we can improve a bit. But right now we have a very hacky way of doing this where we we have a process that basically looks for for new new clusters, new uh, cluster type resources, and then uh, creates the secret the way Argo expects it. Uh, and then uh, because we have so many options, uh, we have confused users as well. So uh, working out best practices is something we've been trying to figure out. Uh, the first one is how to manage secrets. Uh, I think there's a lot of people confused about this as well. Uh, there's two things that people want in our community what some people want to uh, actually it's not really secrets is how to handle sensitive information inside kits so they actually want to version their their the sensitive bits even passwords so they want to have a way to encrypt them and uh, push them to git and then have argo decrypting on the fly when when deploying and things like SOPs or sealed secrets uh, help quite a bit but then some people want just to have like placeholders and then uh, pull the secrets at deployment time and there's a cool uh, plugin for for argo cd uh, from ipm that we actually use internally to 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 pull secrets from vault then if you start using things like uh, uh, crossplane uh, crossplane in addition to it, these providers it also has a lot of uh, uh, cool cool ways to do composition uh, and to like 
deploy complex infrastructure uh, as uh, kind of uh, uh, higher level abstractions of multiple components. And uh, this is something that is really interesting, but it overlaps a bit with the idea of using this Helm uh, meta charts or umbrella charts where you have a ton of dependencies and then you just deploy one Helm chart with different configurations and then uh, it pulls, pulls all the rest. So this is something uh, People also ask uh, ask us like what what should we use, and then of course like uh, which tool should we use? Uh, we have people using Argo, we have people using Flux, we have people using GitLab CI as well to push directly to the clusters. So there's there's pros and cons on all of them. Uh, but coming to the conclusion, and then I'll yeah we're not happy to take questions. Um, and what we are doing today is really literally managing hundreds of clusters on premises in this way. Uh, and we have tens of clusters in different public clouds and regions. And in some cases in, in a single uh, plane. So we, we manage tens of clusters in, in one single Largo CD uh, deployment with tons of applications inside. So we do GitOps for everything. And uh, we started by doing the add-ons and the workloads. Now we do also the clusters. And this means that we actually can uh, add a bit of YAML with a cluster to Argo and associate what should be running on that cluster uh, in Git. And we will have the full thing running in yeah, 15 minutes. So that that's, that's something that is uh, like, for us, it's hugely, uh, beneficial we, we can we can have a lot of flexibility like this uh, this flexibility also means that we, we we can do a lot of savings uh when using the public cloud if we can just switch the workloads this is true for the infrastructure obviously some of our, our workloads have uh, need a lot of storage in that those cases a bit more complicated and uh, the key here is really the Kubernetes api and the fact that uh, the um, all the public cloud providers offer these uh, managed services, but also that there's such a rich ecosystem around it uh, in cloud native, things like Argo, Crossplane, that makes make our uh, lives really much easier. And with this, um, I'm happy to take questions. I know I covered a quite a quite a bit of different topics, but I, I hope it was uh, interesting overall. Yeah, Ricardo, that was an awesome talk. I mean, really, really enjoyed the talk. Um, I thought it was pretty funny when you, when you showed like, this is what physicists actually care about. You know, not like really big, us cracking up, like not really like big machinery. And yeah, like just just a beauty, like I was reading some of the questions like that you saw the, the just the intrinsic stuff you saw at CERN. Is this such big, big scale? You're showing like, you know, at one time a peak workload, 25,000 cores. It's amazing that GCP has that many pools like lay, laying around. Um, but yeah, yeah a perfect talk. I mean, it looks like um, you know some some questions are just coming in. Uh, Sarah, I don't know if you have like an, an order you'd like to go through, or Ricardo, if you want to just crack open the chat, we can kind of like you know go through them. I'm just looking at a few. Yeah, um, some of them are like you, you already talked about. So one question was like, well, how do you do multiple cluster deployment? <laughs> yeah, you kind of, you kind of you touch, you touch that in the, the the talk, but let's see. Let's check here. I'll try to. Open yeah, I think there well. was one around secrets operator, <clears throat> and maybe something around um, Tecton. Right. I think it was like a suggestion from Ravi. It was like, uh, yeah, like you could use as a funny joke, as an aside. Encryption makes everything slow, Ricardo. You know that. <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Tecton, yeah. So Tecton, uh, we we actually use uh, Argo workflows. So here I covered Argo CD. Uh, we use we have we have uh, actually from the CMS experiment. There's there's someone that is very interested in pushing for Argo workflows to to deploy physics work physics work workflows. Um, there's a, they gave a really cool webinar where they said, that I think the title was from zero to physics in minute, in seconds using Argo workflows, something like they said, I think it's, it's online, this, this webinar, you can have a bit more detail. Uh, and the other area we use also Argo workflows is within Kubeflow. 
So we have a Kubeflow deployment uh, in a house uh, where Kubeflow pipelines uh, relies on our workflows. There's there's Tecton support added, I think, in the very last version. But we're actually using like two or three versions behind still. And uh, in those cases, like the Kubeflow pipelines are Argo workflows. Uh, it, internally, we also use workflows, Argo workflows for things like uh, uh, operational, uh, like repeating uh, operations, uh, things like uh, we had a massive uh, migration uh, campaign and we actually rely on Argo workflows to, to, to trigger and control all this operation uh, and kind of uh, follow the visualization is always very nice we can follow a bit the progress of the, the migration campaign uh, using this this interfaces yeah so th there's a question about ingress objects and dns so that's a very good question uh, um, the the main answer here here is uh, people can use either ingress or service type load balancer so they if they use service type load balancer i have a, a small a short slide about it uh, basically the nodes uh, that serve the workloads they will register with the load balancer instance with a pool that serves that load balancer and this is done by by the the cloud provider that we have uh, if they are using ingress uh, and, and and in that case of service type load balancer you just put the dns on the on the top level uh, load balancer instance, uh, which is serving using a virtual IP. Uh, but for for ingress objects, we actually have one of the add-ons we have on every cluster is uh, looking at all the ingresses uh, and doing a synchronization with what we call the network database uh, at CERN. Uh, and this associates all the ingress nodes uh, with this DNS entry. So then uh, the, the, the network database will actually do DNS load balancing between all the ingress nodes that, uh, that uh, uh, are serving that specific uh, uh, endpoint. Yeah, so that, that, that works very well for, for, for multiple clusters as well. We have this uh, central database uh, that then manages DNS centrally as well. Uh, Argo rollout. So, I, I do not use it. I know some people use it. Uh, I cannot say a lot more about it, but uh, I'm happy to 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 ask the people doing it and, and provide a bit more more information. Uh, a bit of clarification: How do users access their deployed application? So this is uh, completely dependent on the application itself. Uh, in some cases. Uh, if it's like a, like the users of the applications, they will use whatever service endpoint is there. For for the for the people that are interested in the applications, they have different roles in the clusters. So they, in some cases, they are able to like check the logs, or even do some some more checks inside the containers if they need. But uh, but this is all our back based uh, and. Uh, it's kind of independent of the Argo Argo uh, setup. Uh, it's the clusters have have uh, uh, Open ID Connect configured, so people can just use the the CERN credentials uh, to 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 get mapped to to the roles in the clusters, and these roles are managed centrally again, and mapped to uh, to uh, different groups of people at CERN. I hope this made sense. Cool. Yeah. That looks like that was that was all the questions. Let's see. Oh, there's one more popping in here. Mm -hmm. So Argo CD permissions managed along the same way. So yep. So we integrate Argo with our uh, identity provider and uh, we map uh, different roles to to uh, to uh, to the groups at CERN. Uh, we have our like central SSO. And uh, in the in our SSO, you can have you can define roles that then map to, to Kubernetes roles, and those roles are associated with basically LDAP groups. 
So that's uh, the last question there is, could we compare cross-plane with cluster APIs? Um, this is something that uh, I, <laughs> I had someone asking the exact same question just uh, like yesterday. I, I, I'm not, a, uh, so I, I will, I will, say I'm not an expert in the cluster API. I'm very willing to learn more about it. But my understanding is that cross-plane goes quite a bit beyond the what the cluster API uh, does. Like it does feel like there's an overlap, especially if you if you are using it in the way that I described here, which is cross-plane to actually manage uh, clusters in remote clusters. Um, but but cross-plane is a lot more than that. Like the providers can manage any kind of resource. Like if you go to AWS, you can manage your uh, uh, database instances, your S3 buckets, everything. But then cross-plane where it really shines is also this idea of composition, uh, which is uh, to define uh, like high level resources that have different components. And those components can actually be mapped to different uh, types of resources depending where they are being deployed. So, say for example, in AWS you would have an RDS instance, and in GCP you would have something else, the equivalent. So the, this this idea of composition is uh, is very powerful in cross-plane. And as I mentioned, like it's something that uh, we are trying to understand better where the overlap is and the like where the complexity is justified to use something like composition with cross-plane versus a more complex way of defining uh, uh, everything in hub charts or not more complex, but having this idea of umbrella charts with the uh, independencies. Yeah, we, we laid down most of our AWS infrastructure with cross-plane today, where I work in so like, and also we're a provider for cross-plane and uh, yeah, you're exactly right. Like Crossplane is an ISC provider, their infrastructure is good, right? Versus Cluster API is just for creating clusters. And so it's like, you know, not yeah. going to go too much of a spiel across things if you're a webinar, but yeah. Right. Spot on. Yeah. But, but it is something we are exploring, uh, especially because like we started using Kubernetes, I don't know, back in 2016, I think it was when we went to kind of production at CERN. And the way we orchestrate our clusters is kind of aging. Uh, so uh, we are actually looking at having something like one Kubernetes cluster that everyone has access and where they can deploy their own clusters directly via the, the Kubernetes API. And this could be the cluster API for this purpose because you're really just wanting to spawn clusters on premises, for example, for, for each uh, individual user or group of users. And there, it seems like the cluster API could be Pretty cool. Uh, you can achieve similar things with crossplane, but then yeah, crossplane can also bring bring a lot of more stuff. So it's it's a discussion we are having. Uh, yeah, it'll be interesting to see what people present in the next couple of conferences as well. Awesome. I, I think that was it for the questions. I know. Uh, thank you so much, Ricardo, for coming uh, late in the evening, uh, your time zone. Very interesting. Um, if you're able to catch up with Ricardo and Sarah at uh, KubeCon, uh, you're up, make sure to catch them. Unfortunately, I get to catch you in Detroit <laughs> uh, sure this year. Um, but yeah, and also um, lastly, um, it's my turn next week. So that I guess they have the, hope, uh, the following speaker do the moderation. So I'll be talking about uh, abstractions at the, uh, at the application level. So what do you actually feed Argo? Uh, this is stuff that I've been focusing on for developer experience. And so, uh, but yeah, hey, Ricardo, thank you so much. Uh, awesome talk. Really always great to hear you speak and uh, all the great stuff you're working on this year. Awesome. Thank you very much.